do Office of Postdoctoral Services. And we'd like to welcome you to our workshop today on careers in patent law and patent agency. This workshop is sponsored by the Duke Career Center, specifically uh, Patricia Calloway in the back, who is one of Duke's two graduate career counselors. So thank you very much for coming. Today we're pleased to welcome four panelists who I will introduce very briefly because they're going to talk more about their backgrounds. Jessica Korzynski received her PhD in chemistry from the University of Virginia and her JD from Wake Forest University. She's a patent attorney for Womble, Womble Carlisle, Sandridge, and Rice. Laura Kiefer received her PhD in biochemistry from Duke, yay, and her JD from UNC Chapel Hill. She's a patent attorney for the Olive Law Group. Robert Schwartzman received his PhD in pharmacology from UNC Chapel Hill and his JD from Georgetown University. He's a patent attorney for Myers, Myers Briggs, Beagle, Sibley, and Sagimac. And Jeffrey Sunman received his PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from Mercer University and completed postdoctoral fellowships at UNC and NIEHS. He's a patent agent at Alston and Bird. So to begin the discussion, um, we'll, I'll ask the panelists to give a brief description of their background and their careers to date, and then we'll move to questions. Um, many of you submitted questions online. Thanks very much for that. So we'll start with those, but feel free to ask questions whenever one arises to you. Would you like to start, Jessica? I'd love to. So um, I'm Jessica Brzezinski. I'm from Massachusetts. I got my um, bachelor's degree in chemistry at the University of Massachusetts and then headed to UVA um, and uh, did my graduate research in chemistry. Um, when I went to graduate school, I think I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. It was sort of the next logical step. Um, and about, probably about my third year, I guess, I realized I wasn't so sure what you know, what that was going to turn into and sort of panicked and wasn't sure um, a life in the lab was for me. So I, I did a lot of just online research and ended up finding, finding out a little bit about patent law. Um, didn't know that much about it. Nobody in my family um, was a lawyer. I didn't really know anybody who was who had gone to law school. Um, so it was, it was a, big, um, a big step to sort of gather all the information, made the decision to go to law school. Um, and I went, to, I went to law school at Wake Forest and then um, got the position in Raleigh, and um, I've been practicing for about four years. I'm Laura Kiefer. Uh, let's see, I came to the area to code to graduate school here at Duke, and uh, I love the area. I love it so much. I haven't sent, left since. Um, let's see, so I graduated from Duke as a graduate student and I always wanted to go into industry so I always wanted to take my uh, you know scientific discoveries and really make them work in a real life situation so I was so excited I wanted to do a postdoc at Glaxo which I did and during that time Glaxo merged with Glaxo Welcome so I got an idea of what it's like to work in industry when people are worried about losing their jobs uh, so it was quite different from being in the lab where everyone's focused on the research uh, that was great, and then I left there, got my first job as a scientist after my postdoc at a small pharmaceutical startup company, also a pharmaceutical type of company. I was there for about two years, and that's when I realized that working by myself in the lab was not as much fun <laughs> as I originally thought. It was, I felt like I was doing the same experiment over and over, and uh, although I love science, I still love science. I just thought uh, I'd like to work on cutting edge science, um, and I'm a good writer, and so I started doing some research, like Jessica said, and realized I could be a patent agent. Oh, that'll be great, I'll be able to write, I'll be able to interact with people more, um, and I'll still be involved in cutting edge science. Uh, so I worked actually at Alston and Bird as a patent specialist, and um, thought, yeah, this is great, I like this. But I, I just, I really like being involved closely with the science and scientists. So I thought, well, if I work in a company, I'll have more an opportunity to do that. I worked in-house at Paradigm Genetics for a few years as a patent agent. And actually, I love that, because that was really fun. So I'm at a company, and we're all working on the same technology, writing their patent applications. But for me, again, I felt like, oh, uh, now, you know, here I am, a PhD scientist, I'm a patent agent, I really want to be an attorney so that I can do the whole range. You know, not just working on the patents up to issuance, but also being involved in the business how do you take advantage of the patents, you know, licensing them, and, and what happens after the patents are issued. So I went to uh, UNC Law School full-time and decided to go full-time rather than at night, although a lot of people do that. I thought that my company was going to be sold, and it ended up that it was. So I thought, well, this is a good time for me to just bite the bullet, go back to law school full-time. 
I did, um, and then I worked at a small boutique patent law firm, also only for a year, and uh, that was my intention to work in a law firm to get the most, the widest breadth of experience. Um, did that, and I actually liked it a lot, but this opportunity came up at a small company, a medical device company, a startup again, which I love, um, uh, working on medical device coatings. And they kind of recruited me, and background was such a great fit with my graduate work at Duke. I thought this would be great, I'll be able to work, you know, really close to a scientist again on their patent matters. And so I took the job at Affinergy, was in-house counsel for over three years, and then just recently switched to Olive Law Group. The um, person that started Olive Law Group, Bentley Olive, I had worked with him while I was at the uh, small law firm, that's how I met him. And so he had an opening, and Affinergy was kind of uh, downsizing me anyway. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> so I thought, okay, this is a great opportunity. I'll try I'll try a really small law firm. So I was the fourth attorney to join. So it's a completely different experience than any other experience I've had you know, in the law firm. And we can talk more about that. So I've been there since January. My name is Rob Schwartzman. Uh, undergraduate degree in chemistry and then a PhD in pharmacology. Uh, I did a postdoc. Uh, up at the Carnegie Institution of Washington in Baltimore, and by the time I finished my postdoc, I decided I really wasn't that excited about doing research anymore, so I looked around for stuff to do. Other than research, I ended up going to the patent office to be a patent examiner, and so I worked at the patent office for about six years, and then when I got tired of that, I left and went to a law firm up in D.C. to work as a patent agent and also decided to go to law school part-time while I was working. So I went to Georgetown for law school and did that in four years. Uh, stayed in D.C. a few more years until I got tired of living there. And then uh, came back down here because we knew Carolina was such a nice place to live. So I searched for a law firm job down here. got one at Myers Beagle. I've been there about uh, four and a half years now. That's it. Uh, my name is Jeff Sundman. I got my bachelor's degree in biology from Stetson University, and my PhD in pharmaceutical sciences and pharmacology at Mercer in Atlanta. We came up here so I could start a job in the industry. That didn't end up happening. Um, <clears throat> I started a pretty extensive career as a postdoc uh, at UNC. I was there for two years, and then I did a five-year postdoc at uh, NIHS over in the park. Um, I've been a patent agent at Austin Bird for about for almost two years now. <coughs> Sorry, I need more water. Um, <coughs> I'll just leave it at that until I get my voice back. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fair. There you go. So, can you talk about a typical day? <coughs> Do you go to meetings or answer emails? Or? It's sort of, I mean, it, it varies day to day. It's really that's one of the things I love about the job. It's not the same thing every day. Um, sort of, you never know who's going to walk in your door, what email you're going to get. Um, you know, the phone's going to ring. Who's going to be on the other end? Um, so I like that it's a real mix of things. You deal with a number of different people and a number of different matters on a daily basis. Um, and that's one of the things for me is being being exposed to a number of different areas of science. And it cannot, it, you know, it can happen in in one single day that I'm you know, dealing with one case that's, say, a pharmaceutical case, another that's a, a straight polymer case, another that's a chemical synthesis case. So, um, you know, I think the, the aspects of technology that you may be dealing with on an everyday basis are can, can widely vary. I mean, you have days that maybe you'll, you'll focus on one particular application, you know, and you'll spend the entire day dealing with one area of technology, but then other days you deal with, you know, five or six even different, different areas. Um, yeah, it's a real mix. Do you only deal with things that are within your PhD focus, or do you deal with things that are outside? Not really, and that's, that, I think that's one of the things that surprised me when I first started learning about patent law, is that, it, you know, sort of, I, I think that what comes out of having an advanced degree and the benefit of having an advanced degree in, in the legal field is that, you know, you sort of, it, it's not so much the, the specific technical knowledge that you amassed, um, it's more your ability to research and find out about different things. Um, and you know, being in graduate school, you've shown that, that you're able to, to sort of you know, venture into a new area of science and learn all about it um, and sort of build up the knowledge you need to, to succeed in that area. And I think it's very much a similar thing. Like I've, I don't think I've done anything since I started 
in patent law that's, that's really, really um, similar to what I did in graduate school. It's, it's definitely, definitely expanded my technical knowledge a lot, um, you know, having to learn about lots of different areas, you know, related to chemistry. And my, uh, my PhD was strictly in chemistry, but, um, you know, I've done sort of more biotech patent work. I've done some more mechanical, um, you know, how things work type things. And then, you know, some things that are much, much closer to my focus area, like pharmaceuticals and um, polymeric coatings and things like that that are much similar, much more similar to what I did in graduate school. But it's definitely, it definitely expands far, far beyond what, you know, what you, what you focus on in grad school. You're not pigeonholed. Definitely not. Or any thoughtful? Yeah, I would agree with Jessica. That was one of the reasons I was interested to be able to work, you know, not just on my small technology focus in the lab, but really lots of different Technologies, and that's definitely the case. I would agree with what she said about just uh, being able to research and quickly learn about a new area. Mm -hmm. And it's not on the level, I found that it's not on the same level as when you're doing research. You, know, you don't have time to get to be that kind of an expert. Um, I was like, when I, I've worked in both industry and in law firms, and in big law firms and small law firms now, and it really varies a lot. So day to day it's going to vary a lot depending on where you want to work. So yes, and I like the way it varies a lot. So some days I'll be focusing on one patent application I'm drafting of all of the technology in that one document, and then other days I may have client meetings, and nowadays I'm trying to build my business, so I spend a lot of time networking, um, a lot of time. I'm, I'm really introverted, um, so that's been, you know, that's a challenge for me. And I would say I saw that one of the questions was, um, you know, what are some skills, and I would say what ways to get in to the career, and I would say this goes for any career, and I wish I would have done more of it when I was young, but just networking. You know, the more you can get yourself out, and the more you can meet people, that is so great for building your career and just having career opportunities. How many of you consider yourselves introverts on the panel? Whoa! <laughs> 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 so you're going to have to be an extrovert to have a career in this field. I do not think an extrovert could be a good patent attorney. That's just my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, yeah, you have to be able to focus. Huh. That's interesting because I, I thought it was I thought it would be the other way around. That it would be much more of an extrovert than you. Well, I, I think one of the keys is you spend a lot of time uh, trying to convince people of your position, whether it's with a patent examiner trying to get your application allowed or dealing with a party from another company that wants to license or something like that. So uh, not so much being extroverted, but being able to provide convincing arguments, I think is really key. So uh, in my experience as an examiner, there are some uh, applicants that prefer to yell and scream to try and get their point across. Uh, I can tell you it's really not very effective at all. So uh, I think if you could calmly and reasonably and with logic present your arguments and present your legal support and that, that type of skill I think is probably the most important. Yeah, I, I would say that just the ability to communicate, not really being extroverted, being a people person and being able to carry on conversations for 30 minutes, but being able to effectively say what you want to say and get across the points you want to get across. I think that's probably a summation of what everyone else so that was trying to get <laughs> yeah. Being able to communicate both uh, in your writing and in your ability to speak uh, with someone either in person or on the phone, that's incredibly important. And, and you touched on this a little bit, but so how did you find your current positions? None of you decided like to get a JD right off the bat, right? You all started working in the field first. So. I actually didn't. I think I'm the only one who went straight, um, straight through. And I sort of, you know, I was in graduate school and and I sort of thought that knowing my personality, if I left and got a job somewhere else, I wasn't sure I'd ever go back to school. Um, so I thought it was sort of easier for me just to just to make the transition, you know, stay in grad school and finish that in five years. And then within a week of um, defending my dissertation, I started law school. So I, and, and in that time, I had to move from Virginia to, uh, to North Carolina. So it was probably the busiest week of my life and uh, one of the most stressful times. But um, you know, I, I sort of, for me, it sort of made sense to just keep going, and I knew, you know, I, well, I didn't know. I was pretty sure I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, so, you know, just sort of stayed with the momentum of school and kept it going. So I just went through, and then um, I just sort of, I found my jobs through um, just sort of traditional channels in law school. 
Um, so in law school, usually after your second year, um, you try to find an internship for the summer um, that hopefully will lead into a full-time position after your third year of law school. And um, that's that's how it happened for me. Um, actually, I worked at Austin for some of these others. And, um, you know, I, I worked there over the summer, and then it turned into a full-time position, and I was there for about a year and a half after that. So everything, everything sort of just, it fell into place in a way. It's sort of like the logical, I guess, law school transition of how, how a number of, of law students get their positions. How about the rest of you? I also did a summer internship that ended up not turning into a job, but then another local law firm hired me. But I've been in this area since graduating from Duke, uh, so I've made, you know, it's a fairly small area in terms of science and patent law. So I've, I have a lot of contacts, um, and so I think that when I see other people so doing an internship at a law firm or even at a company, that often leads into a job. For me, I had been practicing patent agent, so that gave me a big edge, and it was also right before the economy turned down. I think it's more difficult, I think that's a fair statement that it's more difficult now. So I think in terms of getting a job, you can take the patent bar prior to law school. You don't you can be a patent agent without law school, obviously, so that is something to think about if you're really interested. If you have already passed the patent bar, that will make you more desirable to an employer, because then you'll be ready to go. You can already draft and prosecute patent applications. So I had that, I had that experience, and that helped me get a job at a law firm. Yeah, you know, law firms are looking for people with patent experience, and if, you, if you're going through law school and you're doing a summer uh, internship, then it's, it's not that hard to pick up patent experience. But if you're not in law school, uh, it can be quite difficult. So I would uh, suggest the patent office route as one way to go. Um, it's certainly the quickest way to pick up patent experience. Uh, when you're an ex-examiner, that's usually a, a pretty good mark when you go out looking for a job. Um, uh, in DC, there's lots and lots of uh, ex-examiners, but when you get outside of DC, uh, they're very few and far between, so it's a very desirable trade, I think, to a lot of law firms. Um, so that's one route to go to get your patent experience, or I think another one you can try is working with the school technology transfer office to get some kind of patent and licensing experience. Um, so if you're not going to go to law school, I think that is a, another alternate pathway you can take to get into the field. I think the patent office is actually hiring. <coughs> They're hiring right now. They're looking for 40 or 50 people in the biotech and uh, pharmaceutical area, I think, this year and probably hiring more next year. So it's actually a good time. Uh, the patent office budget, as you can imagine, comes and goes. So there's a lot of times when they're not hiring at all, but this happens to be a time that they are hiring. So I found my job as a patent agent um, just watching online for job postings in the area. Um, I didn't know I was a postdoc at EHS when I started, uh, when I really decided that I wanted to be a patent agent. I, Came up here with the intention of going into industry when I got my first postdoc at UNC, and whenever I started my second postdoc, that's when I sort of started looking around at other things I wanted to do, maybe outside of the lab. And had it all was something that I uh, was particularly interested in. Uh, I just like the writing and the reading part of science more than I'm doing. And my wife is an attorney, so the whole law thing was already always in the air anyway. Um, and with about two years left on my last postdoc, I decided that this is what I was going to pursue full time. I was going to give myself a year to uh, get experience because I was starting completely from scratch. I had no experience of any kind that I could put on my, put on my resume. So I spent that first year building my resume and I was going to give myself the second year to try and find a job. And it turned out that at the end of that first year, when I had taken and passed the patent bar and I had done uh, a ton of networking, which I was, was awful at networking, but <laughs> ridiculously bad at it. I would, go to, I would go to things like this and then leave without talking to anybody. I'd go to, to some seminars and symposiums and not get any cards and things like that. But the more you do it, the better you get at it and the more people you meet. And in the end, that turned out to be, uh, be really valuable. So at the end of that first year, I saw that uh, Pat Nature position had opened in Austin and Bird. And it turned out that um, I just passed the patent bar the week after it opened. Um, the hiring partner was on a career panel that I was hosting, and 
like a week later I had an interview set up, a week after that I had the interview, a week after that I got the job. So a lot of preparation, a lot of luck, a little bit of luck in there. But I know for a bad agent job, you can usually just find those looking around um, on the different websites for companies and law you know, firms. But it helps certainly to, to have some contacts that can give you a little advance notice. And Jeff, are you thinking about going to law school? And furthermore, we hear that sometimes firms will pay for their patent agents to go to law school. So I think that Austin and Bird does pay a percentage to go to law school, depending on how, much, how well you do. I think they reimburse you for your grades. Um, I'm not imminently going to law school. I'll, I'll go with my kids in 15 years, wherever they go. <laughs> um, I, I really enjoy being a patent agent. It's, uh, it's not as many hours as being a patent attorney. And it's really, we, we can do a lot of the same things. We do, we both do patent preparation and prosecution. Um, but as everyone else has said, patent attorneys have a little more breadth for the things that they can, they can do. Um, but as a patent agent, we work at uh, some fewer hours. And, uh, I, I enjoy that because I have two small kids and I like you know, being there an hour less a day or two hours less and not having to go in on weekends and things like that. So, you know, that's a career lifestyle choice for me. And, uh, in the future, you know, law school is certainly something I'm interested in. You know, I would like to do uh, you know, a few more things, but for right now, that engine's good. Okay. And will any of your firms pay for or all for law school that you're aware of for patent agents? Not that I'm aware of, no. My firm is really small, so yeah. So. So any questions from the audience at this point? Yes. When you say, Jeff, when you say you work a few hours less than a patent attorney, roughly what is that? So if you look at it over the course of a year, if a patent attorney has to work, I don't want to assume anything, but around 1,900 hours is minimum, somewhere like that, 1,850, 1,900 a year, uh, we work about 200 less. So if you Look at it over the course of the year, it's three or four hours less a week that we have to build. And you know, it's an extra hour, roughly an extra hour a day, which may not sound like a lot, but if it's the difference between you know getting home at 5 30 versus 6 30 every night, you know, depending on what you're you know, what you have going on. Yeah, and the way that the hours that Jeff is talking about too, so we um, we sort of talk in terms of billable hours. And um, a billable hour does not necessarily translate to an hour that you're in the office. So an, an, a billable hour is actually an hour that you can bill to a client. So that's when you're 100% you know, focused on doing the work you have for that client. So if you get up to you know, get a drink or you're out talking to people in the hallway, obviously that doesn't count to your time. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. I mean, you, you really have to keep track of all your time. And when you're sort of jumping around between different projects, um, as we were talking earlier, you, know, you have days that you may work on six different projects and you sort of have to keep track of, I worked on this case for this long and then I took a you know, five minute break and then I worked on this case and I did this for this long. Um, so you can tell your client exactly what they're paying for in the end. Um, so you know, we do have, we have an 1800 or 1900 um, billable hour requirement, but to get that, that's not necessarily working 1800 or 1900 hours. You work a good deal, number of hours more than that to, to make that requirement. All of the things being equal location and experience. Um, so I think that the market right now, the starting salary for a patent specialist, which is someone who hasn't taken a patent bar, is somewhere around 70. Uh, with, with the patent bar, it's around 80. And then we have increases yearly on performance and the time you're there and things like that. It's a completely different pay scale in, in a firm setting than what uh, attorneys are at. And uh, like we can't become partners in the firm. So uh, with a patent agent, you're, you start as a patent agent, you can become, in most places, a senior patent agent. And that's sort of where your career um, you know, would end is as a senior patent agent. Like we can't go on to become you know, a junior partner, a senior partner, you know, part of a partner's committee, things like that, uh, like attorneys can. So uh, in the end, um, there comes a pretty big disparity between the salaries. 
Yeah, let's say starting salary-wise, difference may be $30,000 higher for a, a first-year attorney than an agent. Uh, and as Jeff said, of course, you know, as attorneys progress towards partnership, salaries go up. And uh, so it will ultimately be quite a bit higher than an agent. But, but there's a price of being an attorney, as Jeff said, as well. So. And what's the time frame to like progress from beginning attorney to partner to senior partner? Is that like five years, ten years? Every firm's a little different. Uh, there is a partnership track that has a set length of time until you're eligible for partnership. Um, I'd say seven years is pretty typical, maybe six to eight years in general until you're eligible for partnership. And then uh, it's not automatic. You have to be voted by the current partners to become a partner. Um, and then different firms have different levels of partner as well. There can be junior and senior partners. Uh, in our case, we actually only have one level, so it's a little simpler. But um, yeah, you have to figure you're going to work seven, eight years before your partner. I have to say it's a, it was a huge um, change for me going from the lab where it's completely flexible and you're really on your own designing your experiments and into a deadline you're sitting at a desk every day in front of the computer and having these strict deadlines and these very like, like Jessica was saying, just the billable hours, you know, keeping my time in six minute in increments was a really difficult transition for me. And that's part of the reason I think that I'm so drawn to um, companies, working in a company where, you know, it's more kind of hands on with the scientists and it's less, you know, taking, keeping track of my time in that amount, in that strict of an interval. Um, but you do get used to it, and it's doable. It's just different. And in my small law firm, you know, now I'm back to the billable time. But it really, like, once you get used to it, it's it's fine. And you do that in a bunch of night timers, or what? <laughs> well, we got a we had a tracking system, and that was great. It took just a little bit, of, you know, getting used to. But then I would just turn the timer on, and then, like Jessica had said, if I was taking a break or I was switching, I would just turn it on. But it does require you to focus a little bit differently. You know, I think you're to be aware of it. Um, kind of, you know, I'm going to work on this matter now and focus and then switch and do this one. Yeah, that, that brings up a point, too, is that one other nice thing about the career is that you can, you can sort of do your work from anywhere. So, you know, we don't necessarily have to be in the office to do this. We have our computers wherever we are. We have our timers wherever we are. And so, you know, what the client sees, they don't know if you've done that work at home, at Starbucks, you know, at, at the office. Um, and, you know, we have, we have so many different um, sort of technological things that, that assist in that. So I can pick up my, my work phone at home. And so, you know, there's such a seamless transition between home and work that, you know, clients don't know where you're working from. And obviously what's important to them is that they're getting the end product that they want. Um, so, you know, I, um, I guess to, to Jeff's point too about mm -hmm. hours and everything, I have young kids too. So I leave the office every day at about five or quarter to five, um, which, you know, I may look really bad walking out the door at, at five every day, but you know, I go home and spend time with my kids, eat dinner, and then usually most nights I'll work for an hour or two at night. Um, but you know, so I sort of put my time together differently than maybe somebody who you know goes in in the morning and stays until six or seven. So you have definitely some flexibility um, in being able to get your work done. Question number. This is for Jeff. Um, you said you'd like to remain a patent agent a little bit longer, or, or a good deal longer. Is there any pressure to become an attorney, or are they pretty happy having you as an agent? <laughs> uh, so, in our group, we actually have uh, we have five patent agents um, in our group, and, and we like having patent agents. Um, we don't cost as much to the clients. Our bill, our uh, time is cheaper and, um, for the work that we do, which is mostly preparation and prosecution. Uh, we do basically the same thing that the attorneys do. Um, so there's no pressure in our group to, to move the patent agents up to the patent attorneys. We've had several who have done that. They've gone to uh, uh, NC Central, uh, like my school, or they've gone out and gone full time and come back, things like that. But you know, there's no pressure in our, our group to do that. And, uh, that was something that whenever I interviewed uh, for the position, that, you know, they asked about my told There's no pressure. One point I think we should make too, I don't know what everybody's background is in this room, but I think patent, being a patent agent is something that's much more um, sort of widespread in the biotech area. I don't think there are as many patent agents, if that's something you're considering, in, in other fields. I mean, chemistry, I don't think we run, run across a whole lot of them. 
uh, the majority of people that are in chemistry, I think, are, are patent attorneys, and I think in some other areas that's true as well. So that's something to consider is that your particular area of expertise, you know, whether that's something that lends itself to um, look, even looking for a position as a patent agent versus a patent attorney. Yes? Um, for this, I'm assuming that that uh, your firms are not exclusively patent law, so correct me if I'm wrong, but within your firm, what uh, sort of status does patent law have? Is it as respected as all the others, or is it one of the first things they try to let go when times are tough? Or I don't know. What, what is the environment within the law firm like for patent law? Um, I'm in one of the bigger firms, I guess. Um, I've been amazed, actually. I, I think when I went into patent law, I sort of had the, the concept that patent law would be almost looked down upon. And, you know, I've had certain people who, you know, will, would say to me, oh, you're, you're a patent attorney. I think people, like, people don't know what you do. They don't really, you know, understand it. And it's sort of just that you're one of those crazy science people or something. Um, and, you know, I had that impression from maybe one or two people. Um, but then patent law, I think, is generally considered to be one of the more even areas of law. So, you know, in lots of areas of law, it's, it's up and down, you know, depending on what the economy is doing, um, what's going on in the world, you know, people will put a halt on all their litigation, people will, um, or, you know, you know, companies are very responsive to things. But patent law, I think, is one of those areas that companies understand there's huge value in patents. And if it's a down economy, they're still going to want to maintain, um, you know, their value in patents for when the economy turns around. So during that time, even if they've had to dramatically cut their budgets, in sort of all, er all other areas, I think most companies see patents as such a valuable thing that they still invest the money in, in keeping that going. So when, when the economy turns around and they come out on the other side, they have something there um, to defend. And so I think, um, at least in my experience, um, law firms put a lot of value on their patent, um, on their patent teams and um, see them as sort of a, a very constant stream of revenue. So in that sense, you know, they're very, very important to the to a, a bigger firm um, that has, you know, the sort of counter some other areas that are up and down at different times. So we're, we're, de we're generally more steady <coughs> and even, so definite benefit to the law firm. Is that the experience for the rest of you? Well, there are uh, certainly firms that only do patents or only do intellectual property. Actually, Myers Beagle is one of them. Uh, it's what's called a, a boutique because all they do is uh, intellectual property. and. Um, so it's a little bit different from a general law firm where you have a patent uh, section. Uh, and there's pluses and minuses, I think, both ways. So, um, but that, that is an option. There are lots of boutiques out there as well. And, you know, all different sizes. So we have 34 attorneys, so we're one of the largest boutiques, uh, certainly in the southeast. And, you know, like Olive with, with three or four attorneys, so you could do that just as well. Yeah, we're also a boutique, intellectual property. And so, um, you also worked in industry, Laura. What's your sense for patent lawyers or agents working in industry outside of a law firm? Um, my sense is maybe it makes it, the jobs actually vary more inside of a company. But you know, that may depend on the size of the company. So in a small company, I think the jobs vary more because an attorney is going to be doing more of the business side of versus a patent agent is going to be doing strictly the prep and cross, um, maybe some research and the free and operative kinds of thing, issues, where um, in a law firm it may actually be more similar, or in a big company in the legal department, then maybe the agents and the attorneys are doing more of the same kind of thing, patent and prep and cross. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure there's that much difference really. I think it's probably more to do with the difference of the size of the company. And I think one point to add, too, is uh, a lot of uh, attorneys and agents uh, choose to go from a law firm to an in-house position, in part to get rid of the billable hour requirement, because that's a lot of pressure. Um, but I think it's a little misleading, because every in-house counsel person I've ever worked with works really, really hard and a lot of hours. So they may not be counting their time, but I don't think they work any less. I think that's right, and I, you know, that's what I was trying to get to. I think once I, I think it was hard for me to just get used to putting my, sort of making my time in increments. Um, but once I did get used to it, I realized that really probably there isn't that much difference in the amount of effort you're putting. And once you get used to the system, it's not that bad. But it's a lot, it was a lot of pressure for me in the beginning. It was so different. Yes. Uh, 
Um, this is probably a question mostly for Jeff, but you mentioned that you passed the bar while you were still a postdoc. And so can you just say a little about how realistic it is to pass the bar? I mean, you do it on your own, and you maybe know, take some kind of a course, and how did you learn all that in your past while you were still working at a job? <clears throat> so, yeah, I was a full-time postdoc when I started studying, and I gave myself a year to do it. Um, Typically, it takes about 150 hours to study for the type of bar, which might not sound like a lot, but if you think about it, think about it, it is. Um, and it has a pretty low pass rate as well, so it's, you know, it's a, a big endeavor, and it's, uh, it's something you have to really plan for. I took a, uh, an at-home course from a company called PLI that I bought off of somebody else on Craigslist for cheap, um, but I ended up selling for the same price, so that was great. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, so I did it all on my own. I didn't, uh, I didn't have tutors, I didn't do anything like that. And frankly, whenever you open that book up, I mean, it's a whole, a whole different language. It's a whole new thing. Patent law is a completely different thing than anything you've ever read before. And, um, you know, to do it from scratch is difficult, but it's not it's certainly not impossible. People do it uh, all the time. And, uh, you know, it, it, I probably studied off and on for the first six months, and then Three, you know, for the for the next three months, I studied harder, and in the last three months, I was really, really in it. If I wasn't working, you know, on an experiment, I wasn't reading papers. I was reading my MPP study guide. And the last couple of weeks, I pretty much took off to, to make sure I passed it the first time. So it's a it's a big endeavor. But as as someone said said earlier, I think Laura said earlier, whenever you have the patent bar on your resume, you're going to stand out from. <coughs> so if you're a PhD with you know, with a postdoc or without a postdoc, and you put your resume next to a comparable person, and you have the patent bar, and they don't, you're going to win. It's going to help get you out of the out of the stack of resumes for sure. That was a big deal when I heard whenever I applied. It was certainly something that was I liked favorably. I did kind of the same thing that Jeff's talking about. You said it's a schedule for myself to study. But I think that maybe Rob can talk this a little bit. I think if you, I mean, you might be able to work remotely to be a patent examiner, and then they'll train you. You get like the hands on training and you become a patent. Is that right, Rob? Just yes. to think about it. If you're an examiner for four years, you're exempt from having to take the patent bar. So that is one benefit. Um, uh, the patent office does have a big work at home program or work from distance program, but you have to work there for two years first. After those first two years, you can actually live anywhere in the country and still work as an examiner. So that's one of the benefits they have there as well. So I don't have the, the pleasure of taking the patent bar exam. <laughs> Sorry. It's doable if you're a smart person and you just put yourself on a schedule, though. I, I had the same impression. like, this is a whole other language. This is crazy. But, you know, you just learn it, and then it's just like any other test. If you learn to train yourself with graduate school, you know, you just put your mind to it and you make a plan and you do it. See, you're going to have the added bonus that you have to learn the old rules and all the new rules. <laughs> so you have to study twice as much. <laughs> so you mentioned it. So we talked about a couple of ways you can get started. You can study for the patent bar. You also mentioned tech transfer, which here, by the way, is called the Office of Licensing and Ventures, and it's on Irwin Road. Are there other ways that postdocs and graduate students can position themselves now for this career? Or maybe you want to talk more about working in the tech transfer office or interning? We'll see. I, I worked, um, and I had forgotten to, to mention that in my initial introduction, but I, when I was in grad school, I did work at the tech transfer office at UVA. Um, and it was, you know, sort of doing, I actually did more trying to license technologies and things like that. But it was it was my first real exposure to to understanding sort of the interface between someone coming with an idea um, and then turning that into a piece of intellectual property that a company would actually be interested in. Um, and you know, I don't think I learned so much in doing that about what the actual practice of patent law is like. Uh, but one of I mean one of the huge benefits to me was getting to meet some law students because they had a number of law students interning there as well. Um, so I definitely you know, took that as an opportunity to pick their brains about why they made the decision to go to law school, um, you know, how they enjoyed learning about patent law, what the differences were between 
the little work I was doing in the tech transfer office and what they were learning in law school. Um, so I, I think, you know, again, networking and that sort of thing and just, just taking, as that, taking that as another opportunity to learn was, was hugely um, important and uh, turned into contacts down the road too. Um, I think it was a great experience and I'd, I'd encourage you guys if you have that opportunity to at least go talk to people over there um, and see what it's like. I think to be a, a patent agent or lawyer, you have to really uh, like to write and to be pretty good at it. So I think, I think that's a really important skill. I think being a good scientist, you know, not necessarily a great scientist. If I were a great scientist, I'd still be in the lab. I mean, I have so much respect for a great scientist, but you know, I'm a good scientist and I'm a good writer. I'm not a great writer either, but technically, you know, I can write. And I think that's really important. You know, you're going to need to be able to do that. You're going to write almost all day. You're going to need to get up on new technologies. And, be able to figure out how to, like Rob was saying, how to argue with the patent examiner for your point of view that why these claims are allowable. Um, so that, you know, making sure, you know, even having research articles published, I had, I had a good number of scientific publications coming out of graduate school, and I think that helped me. I like that part of it. You know, uh, one thing you might consider as well is joining some patent organizations, even uh, before becoming an agent or going to law school. And uh, the predominant one for us is, is the AIPLA, which is the American Intellectual Property Law Association, which I imagine you can join without <laughs> being an agent or an attorney. Um, but they have a lot of meetings, they have a lot of material, a lot of uh, webinars. So it's, it's a way to uh, learn some patent law related things. Um, there's a ton of committees that they're always begging people to join. So it's a one way to get involved. And there, there are local organizations. There's a TIFLO, which is a Triangle Intellectual Property Law Association. And there are uh, you know, various other organizations like that. So that is one way to meet some people and, and get a little bit involved, even at this point. There, there may actually also be things within your field that you may not be aware of. Um, so I know when I first started considering that, that I was interested in patent law or you know, going into becoming a patent agent and that sort of thing. Um, I was I was a chemist and I was in the American Chemical Society and I went to some of their big conferences and I was looking down through the list of um, of lectures that were going on, you know, on a given day. I noticed there was a whole area of chemistry and the law and I sat in on a couple of meetings of those which which basically talked like we are sort of about introductions to patent law and what it's like and everything. So that was something that I didn't know existed until I went to the meeting and happened to notice that. Um, symposium. So um, it's another thing to look for is maybe, you know, in your particular area of technology, there might be, be an avenue of, to find out more information, um, sort of focused on your on your area of expertise as well. And I think that if you're, if you're really interested in it, going to things like this, going to, there's symposiums and, and seminars and things like that, the triangle all the time. And if you keep an eye out for them, you go to them, you, know, you meet people, but you also just you will get a sense over time of the important things in the field, the changes that are going on, and you'll start to, to sort of understand what's, what the career is like. You know, talking to agents and talking to attorneys to get an idea about what the job actually is is, is really important. Um, I, I think it's hard to get any practical experience about actually doing preparation and prosecution of patents before you start. You know, as much as I tried to do in the year before um, I got hired, when I went in, I was still completely green about what I needed to do. You know, I knew what the laws were, but that's not the same thing as actually practicing it. Um, but I knew what to expect because I had talked to people, gone to things, you know, researched online, uh, things like that. So you know, do what you can, do what's within your power to improve your you know, what you know about it, as you know, also improving your resume. You know, anything you can do to show your ability to uh, write and edit. You know, if there's things within your graduate programs that, uh, maybe newsletters, things like that. Anything that you can put for like writing and editing that can go on your resume, that's very helpful. Um, I started making things up to, to be able to put on my resume. Like I, I did, um, not literally making <laughs> things up. I, like, I, I was doing webinars for like continuing legal education in patent law. So instead of going to lunch with my lab mates, I was staying in the lab and watching webinars and getting um, you know, certificates for doing for completing CLEs. And, um, I started a, um, a LinkedIn group for people who were studying for the patent bar and, uh, and things like that. So 
you know, there are things within your power to improve your resumes to, to make yourself look better uh, whenever a job opening does come up. So, you know, be creative uh, and try and get out and, and meet people and, you know, do things like this. Make sure you leave things like this with cards. And don't just walk in there. Come talk to us after. Uh, one, one other opportunity I just wanted to mention too is that the Patent Office has started a summer externship program. So you can go work up at the Patent Office and actually do some examining uh, for the summer. Uh, I'm pretty sure the deadline for this summer's positions has passed already, but it's just something to keep in mind in the future. If you're in a position where you could take a couple of months off and go work up there, that would be a great way to get into the field. And so you mentioned like how to make your um, CV, your resume look good. So publications are important because they show evidence of writing. And Jeff, I think what you were talking about would that fall under the leadership skills. So are those the kind of things that are important when people are looking at your resume? Are there other things that postdocs can do to stand out? You know, one of the things uh, we look for is um, uh, enough laboratory experience that you can because uh, one of the keys is being able to communicate with inventors and quickly understanding them and having them confident that in you that you can understand what they're talking about. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're not in this position because you're in grad school or you're past grad school, so you've got plenty of lab experience there. But uh, I would say working in a lab for several years, either in school, in a postdoc, in industry, something like that, uh, to the point where it's clear that you're familiar with a lot of techniques and a lot of, it uh, doesn't have to be every area of science, of course, but, but a reasonably broad area of science, uh, I think is very important. So I don't, you know, postdoc is not required, uh, but, you know, every year more of lab experience where you're actually working on stuff is, is, is helpful. Yeah, Jeff and I were talking about that question because we saw that question, is it desirable or not desirable to have done a postdoc? And I mean, I have to say, I think it's always desirable. It's like pile it on, hire deeper, hire deeper, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, and in that, I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, okay. I was going to say in that conversation, I was saying that, um, so I did two postdocs. So my graduate work my, and each of my postdocs were in different areas. So whenever I, I came and I did my interview, I talked about you know, how much immunology I did in the first place and how much cell biology I did in the second place and how much biochemistry I did in the third place. And what that does is it shows that you're flexible. Like you can flip back and forth like, like Jessica was saying. You know, one, in the morning you can be working on you know, seeds. In the afternoon you can be working on you know, textiles or whatever. You can you show that you're able to mentally flip back and forth between different areas because you, know, you have this broad background to draw from. So you know, doing postdoc is not certainly not a bad thing. Um, yeah, I think ultimately it sort of, it'll sort of give you a different aspect that you can draw on. So clients are, are hugely excited when you have, when, you know, when your background closely parallels them. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, chances are you're not going to run across an invention that's exactly what you looked at in grad school or in your postdoc studies or anything. Um, but sort of, you know, having anything that you can talk to a client, um, you know, knowledgeably right off the bat about. Um, you know, that's hugely important to them. So obviously they've invested all their time and effort into this, you know, one area of technology. And, you know, obviously they're, they're understandably sort of concerned about turning that over to somebody who, you know, who, whose background might be pretty, pretty distinct from that. So, you know, the closer you can sort of draw parallels, like, yes, I didn't do exactly that, but, you know, I have this, this background that, you know, is connected to what you're doing in this way that makes them feel so much more at ease that they're talking with somebody that really understands or, you know, can very quickly understand what it is that's so important about their discovery and why it's so worth protecting. Um, so I think, you know, just sort of doing a postdoc or doing research in different areas just, just helps you build that broad background and makes the client more comfortable. It's going to make, um, make you look really good to employers because employers are going to be worried about making their clients comfortable. Um, so I think it's, it's a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. I think things you can put on your resume, like anything you put on to show that you're serious, you know, you're, you're kind of making a career transition, so it's a little bit of a risk to take you on. So the more you can show, look, I'm already on my own initiative, paid for and spent my time, and I passed the patent bar. And that's huge. Um, so they know, you know you're serious. This is just not like something you're considering. That's just my experience getting jobs and players want people that want the jobs. Yes. Sorry, what do you 
think about the future of, of the field, I mean, especially since um, I've heard of some pushes for automation in other parts of the law, like in discovery. Do you feel that that might um, also uh, affect the, the future in, uh, in patent law, especially in like research or, or preparation of prosecution or, or any of that? Or, um, and just in general, what do you think the future of, of the patent law field looks like? I'd say it's pretty strong. I don't, I don't see anything uh, changing. Uh, it, well, not that nothing will change, because what I was going to say is that um, uh, they just passed a pretty sweeping uh, change in the patent laws last September, and we are all right in the midst of struggling to understand the new patent laws as they go into effect, um, which is, you know, very annoying because we've been doing patent law for many, many years and suddenly everything we know is out the window. But the upside of that is patent lawyers are more important than ever because they keep changing the law and someone needs to understand it. So, you know, for reasons like that, I don't see patent uh, attorneys and agents going anywhere anytime soon. Yes. You mentioned that it's advisable to do summer internships or summer internships to get experience, but if you're pursuing postdoc and you still want to get some kind of experience in it, uh, is weekend work or contract work um, advisable or doable? Is it Can anybody pursue it? Like you don't want to quit postdoc right away. You still want to get experience so that you can put things on your resume, not just attending session exam. It's difficult to find in a law firm. Most law firms don't have that type of position or even volunteer type positions. Um, that's one of the advantages of the tech transfer offices is that they're always looking for volunteers. Um, so that is one of the difficulties. It's really hard because most of the summer internships are reserved for law students because that's a, the standard method by which law firms hire lawyers. So um, I think you'd have to look pretty hard to find some kind of volunteer internship position in a firm. I'm not aware of any. No, I mean, I think because it's really an investment of the attorney or agent's time uh, training you, it's not something that you can really get wrong. So and it's a whole other language, like Jeff was saying. So I mean, if you had already passed the patent bar, I mean, I might consider it, you know, taking you on and then, you know, in a really short term, like, okay, I know, or if you're a quick study, you know, they'll be, okay, this, you know, we can maybe work something out, but that's pretty unusual, and that would be in a flexible situation, like maybe a very small firm or a small company. Um, that's why I think Jeff and I mentioned it's hard to get actual hands-on work, because it's just such a um, niche kind of, you know. Yeah, if you're if you're hoping to go from postdoc to being a patent agent, I don't think, in my opinion, I don't think you should try and focus so much on trying to get experience actually doing the work, but building your resume so that you can get a job to learn how to do the work. Um, you know, do the things that show that you're a good, a good writer, a good communicator, meet people. Um, show, definitely like Laura said, you know, show that whenever that job opening came, you didn't think, oh, patent law sounds fun. That sounds like, I want to get out of the lab. Good with that. It sounds great. They sit at the desks all day. It's fantastic. Um, you know, show that it's something you've been committed to, that, that you've been working on, that you're, you know, really, really interested in. Because it is, it's a big investment for them to bring you on and train you. And if you don't work out after six months, that's, you know, a huge amount of resources lost. Time for one more question. Yes. So looking back at your career as a patent law. What do you consider to be your greatest achievements, or what are you most proud of in the work that you've done? You know, for me, uh, patent prosecution, trying to get a patent through the patent office and get it issued. Um, occasionally, it's quite easy. Very often, it's very difficult. Uh, your most problematic cases, you can be prosecuting with the patent office back and forth for six or eight or even ten years. And uh, so there's a thrill when you have an important patent that you get for your client 
and you get an issue, everyone is so ecstatic. So um, that's really the high point, I think, when you're doing preparation and prosecution. Uh, it's balanced by the low point when you get your 10th rejection from the patent office on the same case, even though your arguments are wonderful. Uh, so that's the downside. But um, uh, the, the companies that are your clients, uh, they rely so much on patents. It's such a huge part, particularly the small companies and the startup companies, uh, that it, it's almost life or death for them to get their patents issued. So when you can help them do that, that's just, it's really exciting. I would say on the, similar, I have the same thing as Rob, but also just, um, especially for small companies, because often the scientists are the closest to it, and it's so exciting for them, and that's the most rewarding for me, is when just drafting a patent application is, it's pretty hard sometimes, it's pretty challenging, you know, but so when you finish it, and you've got the claim set, and you feel like you've really, you know, described, and enabled their invention, and it's all done, and I feel very fulfilled and good about that. Especially then when you send a draft to the client and they read it and they say, yeah, this is exactly right. You got it. You're right. Good. Feels good. It's like, it often takes me a while to get my mind around a technology. You know, it's hard. And then when I do, and it's all in words and it's filed, it's great. I mean, I'm still new enough that my greatest achievement is getting a job in the first place. <laughs> but. But yeah, one of the things that I've really enjoyed about it is whenever you're in the lab, whenever you're, you know, tenure track or anything, it seems like the, uh, the big accomplishments come very far apart. You know, getting a grant, getting a publication, you know, winning an award, things like that. They're like six, six to 12 month kind of things. But one of the things I really enjoy about working in patent law is you get those a lot more often. You know, if you're working on a large portfolio of patents, you know, you get an allowance here, you get an allowance there, you you know, you finish an application, you submit it, and everyone's happy. So it seems like those those moments of accomplishment come along a lot more often than they did the lab. That's one of the things that, that uh, I really enjoy about it. Okay, on that note, let's thank our panelists very much for coming.